Baptism by Immersion by Father Daniel Sezoev from his book, Catechetical Talks. Baptism by Immersion One of the most painful and gross violations in performing the sacrament of baptism is baptizing by effusion, pouring, or even by sprinkling for no apparent reason. Due to this distortion, many hundreds of Christians are confused as to whether their spiritual birth was indeed valid. Many commune unto judgment and condemnation because of this. Dozens of schisms profit by this distortion, claiming that many Christians, even bishops, are not actually baptized. The priest's criminal laziness and indifference give rise to conflicts between local churches. The churches of Greece and Mount Sinai and Holy Mount Athos, doubt the validity of baptism by effusion, to say nothing of baptism by sprinkling. Yet our censor swingers cannot be troubled to furnish their churches with a simple barrel. And this, despite the fact that His Holiness the Patriarch, along with many other bishops, has demanded each year, for over fifteen years, that baptism be performed exclusively by immersion. But the effusionists, brazenly claim that it makes no difference how they baptize, that this is mere ritualism and has absolutely nothing to do with the essence of the sacrament. They care nothing for the opinion and the words of God, the tradition of the church, and the dictates of their own hierarchs. The only means of rectifying this situation may be to resort to canonical sanctions for brazen disobedience to the will of the ruling archpastor. As for the validity of baptism by effusion, those perturbed by this issue must resolve it with the ruling bishop for their particular cases, for it is the bishop who has judicial authority in his own diocese. But now it is time we substantiated the proper means of performing the sacrament. Baptism by triple immersion is expressly required by the word of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ received baptism through total immersion in the waters of the Jordan. It is no accident that the gospel says, And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. The very word baptism used in the gospel, Greek baptizo, immersion into water, literally means immersion. Hence the statement, The immersion was performed by effusion sounds an absurdity. We know that the holy apostles, having received the commandment to baptize all nations, perform the sacrament specifically through immersion. This is also borne out by the example of St. Philip, who went down together with a eunuch into the water for baptism. When the proponents of effusion point out that supposedly, on the day of Pentecost, the apostles could not have immersed three thousand men, and hence poured water over the newly baptized, they are absolutely wrong. In actuality, every Jewish home had a mikvah, basin, for the daily ritual ablutions. On Mount Zion, remnants of dozens of mikvahs have been found, in which this original baptism was apparently performed. It is no accident that it is the means of baptism that the canons decree canonically. The 50th canon of the Holy Apostles states, If anyone, bishop or presbyter, does not perform three immersions in a single sacramental rite, but performs only one immersion into the death of the Lord, let him be deposed. For the Lord said not, Baptize into my death, but, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Likewise, the 91st canon of St. Basil the Great specifically calls the custom of triple immersion a mystical apostolic tradition. The heretic's violation of this standard, according to the 7th canon of the 2nd and the 95th canon of the 6th ecumenical councils, was sufficient grounds for their rebaptism. It is true that both church tradition and the canons the seventh canon of the Council of Neo-Caesarea, provide for baptizing a person through effusion in exceptional and only exceptional circumstances. 
But the church rejects as false reasoning any attempt to make this practice the standard. The most striking example of this is the resolutions of the Council of Constantinople in 1755, to this day in force on Athos, and the Moscow Council of 1620, which reject the validity of Latin baptism specifically because Rome normalized baptism by pouring or even sprinkling. It is no accident that the 1848 encyclical of the Eastern Patriarchs calls the introduction of sprinkling instead of immersion the vile spawn of the filioque heresy and an innovation contradictory to the gospel. In the same way, all the Russian works opposing Catholicism denounce this innovation of the Western Church as unorthodox. The Venerable Kolivadi's Fathers Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, Macarius of Corinth, and others, considered it impossible to recognize Catholics and Lutherans as baptized, specifically because the sacrament was performed by sprinkling. This emphasis on the form of the sacrament is by no means meaningless ritualism. St. Gregory Palamas explained the meaning of immersion as follows. Water possesses cleansing properties, but not in relation to souls. And for one immersed therein, it has the ability to wash away dirt, but not the defilement that originates from the root of sin. Hence, in order to endow it with these properties, for our sake the physician of souls and the father of spirits who is baptized, Christ, who takes away the sin of the world, the four feasts of whose baptism we celebrate this day, is immersed into it. For together with himself he imbued the water with the grace of the Most Holy Spirit, which he drew down from on high, so that for those who would later be baptized in him, by being immersed into the water, he might himself be there with his Spirit, communicating himself to them ineffably and assimilated by them, and filling rational creatures with cleansing and illuminating grace. And this is what the divine Paul says, As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The three immersions into water take place in the name of the saving invocation of the life-creating Trinity, but they also depict the Lord's three-day burial. The immersions are followed by an equal number of emergences from the water, because otherwise three immersions could not take place. These signify alike the resurrection, or arising, from sin, the three-part nature of the soul, and the raising up to incorruption of these three, the mind, the soul, and also the body. Thus, in divine baptism we see both life and death, burial and resurrection, in the image of the Lord, who in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. As he himself says, For the prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. And so it must be with regard to us, who were baptized into his death, because through divine baptism, having died unto sin, we must live unto God by means of virtue, that the prince of darkness, when he comes and seeks, might not find in us anything to please him. And after Christ rose from the dead, death hath no more dominion over him. So also we, after arising through divine baptism from our fall into sin, must take care that sin have power over us no more. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life homily on what takes place in the rite of the sacrament of baptism, which also treats on repentance and what John the Baptist said regarding this, given on the eve of the Feast of Theophany. St. Cyril of Jerusalem adds this to Gregory's words, You have confessed a saving confession, and have been immersed thrice into the water, and emerged from the water again and in this you have symbolically portrayed Christ's three-day burial. For as the Savior abode three days and three nights in the bowels of the earth, 
so also by your first emergence from the water you portrayed the first day, and by your immersion the first night that Christ abode in the earth. For as a person ceases at night to see, but during the day goes about in the light, similarly in your immersion, as in the night, you saw nothing, but in emerging from the water you were as in the day. And at the same time you died and were born, and this saving water was for you both tomb and mother. And what Solomon said concerning other things befits you also. There it is said, A time to be born, and a time to die. But for you it is the reverse, a time to die, and a time to be born. And a single moment accomplished both the one and the other. Both your death and your birth were conjoined. O oh, strange and wondrous thing, we did not really die, neither were we really buried, nor were we really resurrected after crucifixion, but our imitation was in a figure, and our salvation in reality. Christ was truly crucified, truly buried, and truly resurrected, and all this he gave us by grace, that in becoming participants in his sufferings by imitation, we might find salvation in reality. O oh, incomprehensible love for mankind! Christ received nails in his most pure hands and feet, and endured suffering, and to me, though I bore no pain and suffering, grant salvation solely through participation in his sufferings. Catechetical Lecture 20 on the Mysteries 2, 4 to 5. And so, it turns out that one who distorts the apostolic form of the sacrament disrupts the symbol of rebirth. But for us, this symbol is by no means meaningless. It is participation in the reality of the Lord's death and resurrection. How, then, can one believe the form of baptism to be irrelevant to salvation? As we have said, effusion or sprinkling may be occasioned only by highly extraordinary circumstances. Yes, both in church history and in the lives of the saints we see examples of God-pleasing baptisms performed in this way, but all of them were occasioned by illness or severe persecution. Yes, according to ancient tradition, the Apostle Peter baptized those who believed in the Mamertine prison in a spring which he caused to flow from the cliff, and St. Lawrence baptized prisoners by effusion. Baptism by effusion was practiced in the desert, and also in times of illness. But how can this be compared to the practice of baptizing by sprinkling without undressing, without even removing the person's stockings, and hence without anointing the feet with holy chrism? In Russia, with its abundant water resources, where a large barrel or even a beautiful font can be purchased for a paltry sum, it is my firm conviction that baptism by effusion is permissible only for the gravely ill, whose mobility is restricted, or for prisoners, soldiers fighting in arid regions, desert dwellers, if there are no large water sources, or in the tundra at sub-zero temperatures, when no suitable heated facility is available. Baptism by sprinkling is permissible only for patients in intensive care who cannot have water poured over them completely, for instance, a dying infant in an incubator. But every effort should still be made to moisten as much of the body as possible with holy water. In all other cases, the requirement of the 200th canon of the Nomo canon must be followed. When you baptize a child, have a font or tub or vessel, such as a bowl or some other appropriate vessel, and when you pour oil in the font, as the service order dictates, take oil from the bowl with the three fingers and anoint the child on all his members, as the service order says, and then take him naked, and setting him upright, baptize him in three immersions, saying thus, The servant of God, name, is baptized in the name of the Father, Amen, and lower him into the font, and immerse him, meaning to wet him completely. And again rise part way, raising up the infant, and lower him into the water a second time, and wet him, saying, And of the Son, Amen. 
And again arise, and lower him a third time, saying likewise, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. And bathe him the final time. Then, taking him from the font, give him to the godparent. Then the baptized person is clothed in white garments, and the priest puts a cross on him and sings Psalm 31 together with the people. The custom of singing this psalm has its origins in Scripture, where the Apostle Paul cites it, indicating the blessedness of one justified by Christ. This is the standard for the sacrament, and both the bishops and the dean must see that it is observed. But the church laity also must not fail to attend to this aspect of our faith, for according to the encyclical of the Eastern Patriarchs, among us neither patriarchs nor councils could ever introduce anything new, because for us the guardian of piety is the body of Christ itself, that is, the people themselves, who always desire to preserve their faith unchanging and in accordance with the faith of their fathers. Encyclical of the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church to All Orthodox Christians, 1848, paragraph 17. Hence, if any pastor departs from similar divinely instituted standards of baptism by immersion, the flock must humbly point out his error, and if he persists, they must take the matter to the ruling bishop, that this lawlessness may be utterly uprooted in the holy churches of God. This age-old right and duty of the laity was reaffirmed by the Holy Synod on December 28, 1998, which resolved to summon all the faithful of the Orthodox Church to approach their ruling bishop in every case when a pastor and spiritual father oversteps his God-given authority to bind and to loose, to remind the Orthodox flock that the advice of a spiritual father must not contradict Holy Scripture, Holy Tradition, the teaching of the Holy Fathers, and the canonical establishments of the Orthodox Church, and that if their advice should contradict these establishments, preference must be given to the latter.